This is Eric Rutan of Cannibal Corpse. You are listening to the Scars and Guitars podcast with Andrew McKay-Smith. G'day, everybody. Thanks so much for tuning into the show. I appreciate it. I've got a chat with the Swedish maestro Per Nilsson, the fella at the center of Scar Symmetry, to share with you. Now, the catalyst for the chat is due to the launch of a new album from the group, their seventh. It is titled The Singularity Phase 2 Zenitaph. Of course, throughout this chat, we talk all about the album, but that takes a bit of a sideline, to be quite honest with you, because Pear dives deep into what's going on in his own life. I really appreciate that he felt comfortable enough to do that because he gives us a heap of a heap of insight into what makes him tick, what's going on with his personal life and how that impacts the music and indeed how the music impacts his personal life. Elsewhere, I was curious to know if he'd ever been considered as a replacement for Frederick Thordendahl or even as the third guitarist, a third guitarist in Meshuggah because he spent quite some time as the touring guitarist with that group and uh, It's some intriguing commentary that he's got to share about that, to say the least. So yeah, overall, this is one of those conversations that if you're driving, put it on, turn it up. If you're at home, grab a beer, perhaps something to smoke and relax because Pear brings the good oil. He's got plenty to share with you. Before we get to the chat, if you are listening via the podcast apps, I've got a tune to share with you. Of course, it's from the new album and it is titled Chrono Nautilus. It'll play soon for all of you people on YouTube. You know the drill. We don't play music on YouTube. We'll cut to the chat right now. Either way, let's get to it. Yeah. 
absolute morning, is it? I bet it's morning over there, mate, is it? Uh, no, it's uh, it's early afternoon. Aha. Uh-huh. Well, good afternoon then. It's a good evening over here. <laughs> oh, nice. Where, where are you? In Australia, at the obviously in Australia, you're probably on a bit of a, a Zuma grind as we call them in Australia. But I'm on the Gold Coast, mm-hmm. so southeast Queensland. All right, right. Brisbane, Brisbane's the easiest point of reference, I'd say. Yeah, I've never been to Australia, so sadly, but I hope oh, to go nuts. one day. Oh, you'd have to, yeah. Gosh, being a Swede, there's, there's a lot of Swedes in Australia. You might be aware of that, so uh, you'd fit right in for a start because I find that we're. Uh, our personalities, our uh, temperament seems to match each other's. Mm-hmm. Nice. You, know, you notice that? So, yeah, but definitely, gosh, that surprises me given all of the bands that you've been in. And I did notice that you weren't down here in 2017. Was it 17? Yes, it was. Uh, when the sugar came down, Fred was uh, in the band at that point there. But uh, it does surprise me a little bit because, my gosh, You've certainly got an accomplished resume, and uh, it'd be lovely for you to grace our shores at some point. Yeah, and I'm, I'm sure at some point it will happen. We've actually been uh, in talks with <clears throat> Australian uh, agencies and promoters in the past, but it never found a way to make it work. Mm. It's because it's, I mean, it's kind of expensive and to travel for a small. A small Swedish band. Yeah, I'm. I'm hearing you. Yeah, Bjorn's down here a fair bit though from uh, Soil Work. He can't, he's coming down again. Actually, he's just been and gone with Soil Work, but he's coming back with Night Flight Orchestra. So it's definitely possible. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. And if you were able to maybe link up with someone like Bjorn or there, Meshuga, your mates in Meshuga, this sort of thing, I'm sure it'll be. It'd be look. It'd just be great to see Scar Symmetry or or even in any of the other bands that you're in, like Kaipa, even potentially down here mm-hmm. yeah well kaipa never tours uh-huh it's it hasn't been a touring band since the 80s actually Be- long before my time <laughs> because i was i was just a, a little kid back then yeah but yeah yeah, yeah. but now nowadays uh scar symmetry is my my main focus and and while while I'm still um, a member of Nocturnal Rights, uh, we don't have a lot of touring planned. We don't have a new album or anything. So, hmm. so I, I think the the coming few years will be mostly about Scar Symmetry f- for me. Well, that's great yeah, to hear. It's, yeah, yeah, it's, sorry. It's, yeah, it's also like we 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 never were on a complete hiatus. We always did something. We did a few shows a year, and I, I, I was slowly working on the album for all these years. Uh, but it feels like we have now, like restarted, rebooted the band. You know, we have a new record deal. We have new a new management, a new new booking agents. We have all these new things, a new crew, and, and like. Everything has been like built up again, uh, so so now that I, I feel like that's what I want to do. So, and it, it and it feels like we have some stuff to to make up for in, in a way. Mm. Yeah. Well, this album here, this is your seventh album, but it's your first album in almost a decade. It's about nine years or thereabouts, and I'm talking about the Singularity Phase 2 Zenitaph. I love the uh, intricacy of that title, by the way. And Mm -hmm. uh, it's great to – it sounds like you're having a lot of fun, but it sounds like you're intellectual muse because I know you're a very smart fella. You're an intellect. It sounds like that's on fire at the moment because this outlet for your hyper-heavy yet very melodic, slightly dainty side, okay? Uh, that's the way I've described it to people who, for the sake of the podcast and for the show, that's the way I'm describing your sound. But I'm also going to play a song up front, one of the singles that's released as well. But it, what I mentioned in there is it sounds like as though you're having a lot of fun. Is that the case? Indeed. Indeed it is. And uh, I'm, I've am i been doing interviews all day, um, so I'm... Uh, I've been talking a lot about uh, why it t- t- took us 
almost nine years to get get this album out, uh, like uh, almost nine years since the last album. Uh, and for me, like I wrote most of these songs were actually written in 2016. Uh-huh. So so f- for people listening, it it's it, it, it's new, right? But but for me, most of it is it's kind of old by now. Um, so I've. I've had times during these years when I've fallen out of love with the music and then I've fallen back in love with it. And and there's been times where I didn't want to work on it because I was like, I'm not feeling these songs. Maybe I should just scrap them and record new ones. Uh, But I I didn't, of course. Uh, And then I gave it some time and I, I was touring with the other bands I was touring with. And then I got back to it and, and, uh, and felt like a renewed energy and, and felt good about it again. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, awesome. it's, it's very, it's very difficult for me to, uh, to work on anything like musically re- related. If, if I'm, if I'm not in a good mood, if I, if I'm not feeling it, you know, so I'm hearing you. Yeah. So I, I understand where you're coming from. But and, and I'm pretty got I've got a keen ear in so far as I can tell when an artist is within them within their creative muse, if you like. And that's what I heard, because I've listened to your album mm-hmm. a couple of times from the Nuclear Blast Portal. And I'm grateful yeah. that they give us an opportunity to do that because it doesn't always happen. We have a chance to have a listen to an album before talking to an artist. So one, oh, one nice. of the questions, one of the questions that I had for you though is about the song Altergeist. Now, there's a solo at the end of that, which is just bliss. Is that is that your solo there, or is that uh is it Ben Ben Ellis? Is that his solo? Uh <clears throat> shit, I have to think. I there's a <laughs> There's a there's a mid section where there's a, like a really calm part uh, where Lars is singing and it's just like Lars and a very calm backing, no drums, mm. and then and then there's a riff that enters that is similar to the opening riff of of the title track, Cenotaph, mm. uh, and I play a solo over that, and then there's vocals, and then it goes into a, a solo that. Uh, I play again, I think, and then the final one is is Ben. Yeah, is There's a, a lot there of solos go. on this album. Yeah, so, so but it all that works. one might that yeah. one uh, might be Ben. Yeah, he, he rips out some really incredible solos on this one. Yeah, as a guitar aficionado, this is an album with a hell of a lot of great solos, right? Or great guitar leads, great solos. This is. It's technical, but you don't labour the point if you understand what I'm saying. I'll be frank and say that I can't stand artists like Steve Vai. I know a lot of people love him, but uh, mm-hmm. that fretboard wankery doesn't really do too much for me, to be quite honest with you. When I hear mm-hmm. people shredding for the sake of the song, that's a very different story, and I hear a lot of that across this album here. So you and you and Ben, did you when when we talk about crafting solos? Was it one of those things where you had a solo bank and you just were able to sort of retune them for the key of each song, or did you come up with solos in a different way? Well, the first step to create a solo for me is to create the, the to write the solo part. Like, I mean, I record, I, I do solos for for other projects where I haven't written the music, but mm-hmm. in the case of Scarsimeter, where I now write all of the music, I try to write solo parts that. Uh, are interesting to me uh, and I try to use like chord progressions and harmony that will be interesting for me to solo on you know if if it's if it's just like a one note riff you know like a modern gent style riff mm. for me that's that can be a cool riff or it's for me it's very boring to solo over because like the 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 backing part doesn't help you. It doesn't give you anything. So you have to create everything in your lead. So, so I, I like to have a fair bit of chords and, and textures in in like the backing part for the solo. And sometimes I, I set up, for example, like a, uh, I'm a big fan of key changes uh, to, to not have the entire song go in whatever key the, the lowest string is on your guitar. That's that, that's like a typical way of writing metal songs. There are a lot of bands that like we tune in B, so therefore every riff is in B. You know, we want to use the lowest note, 
uh, and and that can be cool but i i like to move around and change keys and and explore different sounds so sometimes i i in my solo parts i set up uh, a nice key change in the solo or leading into leading back to the chorus for example um and and then when i record the solo i i try to like bring out the best of the part i'm uh playing over you know i i want to have some a fair bit of tension and release and and do it in the in the proper spaces and have a nice ebb and flow you know have have the like the virtuosic parts where they need to be and and sometimes where they don't need to be sometimes you want to do something that's uh you know you want to flip the script a little bit so so uh so it's mm. to keep it interesting to to um to serve the unexpected yeah, it's the first album that I've heard since the Fallujah album, uh, also a nuclear blast artist, Scotty Carstairs, mm-hmm. who you might be familiar with. You and yeah, Scotty. Yeah, I know him. Yeah, you and Scotty. He's, he's great. Tr- fantastic fella, great guitarist. You remind me of each other, different different approach, but in terms of the fact that it's always very tasty, the solos are blitzkrieg, they're in the right <laughs> moments, but, and here's a really important point, one of my favourite soloists ever is Ralph Santola, long gone. God rest his soul. Mm-hmm. But uh, he was a master of crafting a song within a song. You know, the solo was a song unto itself. It could almost be extrapolated mm-hmm. and be turned into a melody on an acoustic guitar if you use the root mm-hmm. notes and focused on it that way. I find your soloing is very similar in that respect. So you obviously have spent a lot of time arriving at a lot of time on your craft to arrive at this point that you're at now. Mm-hmm. That's what I'm noticing. Yeah. Anyway, so... What about um, when you're writing? So I, I should ask: Do you do you write for Kuiper as well, or are you, are you just just the guitarist in inverted commas? I'm just a guitarist, though. I record a lot of guitars for Kaipa. It's 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 not only, you know, solos or so. So usually, when I when I get the songs from him, like I, I get a, get a multi track. Uh, um, recording uh, like a demo recording so so it's all his different layers of keyboard parts and then there's like keyboard parts that are intended for me to replace so there's like the melodies and there's mm. the the stuff that's more supposed to be like a riff and then there's chords and and uh, and I get to have a lot of fun with it because sometimes I I play the stuff that he's written note by note for example melodies uh, I'm pretty sure he wants to have them note by note. Uh, I, sometimes I can do little inflections and stuff on it, on them. But then when there's like there's supposed to be chords here, I can I can have a lot of fun with that and layer stuff in in different ways. So I I get to be very creative on the Kaipa albums. Actually, so I'm 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 feeling like I'm really putting my own stamp of it, e- even though I'm not technically a, a songwriter. Mm. Do you find you have to switch modes or mindset in regards to when you're writing or you're crafting parts for Kuiper? Are you still thinking like you're in scar symmetry occasionally? Yes, I suppose I do. It's just like it's it's the same it's the same uh, brain, but it working in a different <laughs> context. It's like, I mean, I don't need to come up with original uh, seven string riffs in Kaipa because that's not a part of the thing so but <clears throat> yeah it's it's still the same like uh, I don't know what to call it I, I, sometimes I feel like I'm uh, I'm like a police detective or something I, I'm, I'm looking for <laughs> clues in the music and nice. to see it like maybe, can, can I see how things are connected and mm. Can I, you know, can I come up with, uh, you know, something nice to bri- bridge parts together? Like if if you have if you have one part that moves to another part, and and if you're feeling like ah, this is not super seamless, it changes uh, time signature or or key or or something, and and then I can be like, is there any way in in my part that I can help smooth this out so it's so it carries the listener. 
with it to to that next part yeah. or 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 vice versa if, if i feel like there's not enough drama here it's like this this part needs to something that um, yeah. snaps the listener out of the status quo yeah yeah gotcha well here's a question for you and i'm aware of course as many people will be that you were in meshuggah for a period of time there when frederick stepped out of the group now Mm -hmm. were were many of the songs that you wrote given that was recorded or a lot of the songs were around about 2016 that's there's quite a few years in between then and now were any of those songs were they potentially mooted or considered for the meshuggah record that came out last year uh, no, so I, I was never. Ne- yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. My, my my songs were never. I, w- I was never considered to be a, a songwriter for for Meshuga. Okay, gotcha. It's just coincidence then that both albums sort of came out when they did. Of course, I mean, you know, bands are in the uh, signed bands, bands with a global following, and the habit of releasing albums. So it's just one of those things. But uh, with regards yeah. to the with regards to your time in Meshuga, was it? ever spoken about that you would potentially stay on even in a capacity as a third guitarist? No, I was never considered as a third guitar player. Uh, when I got the gig, the, the they asked me to do one tour and like, would, would you be able to step in and do a tour with Megadeth in the US? And uh, which was really cool, but not long after we started rehearsing, it was like we might have something like there might be more shows coming in, and and then we don't exactly know when when Felix is gonna come back. Hmm. So and then I kept touring with them, and uh, and Fredrik Fredrik took time off because he wanted to build a studio, and he he wanted to have some time to work on his uh, solo stuff. And I, f- and I think that he <clears throat> he had been looking for for some proper time to do that for a long time. So he was really, he really needed to, to step out for a bit. And I don't think he, I don't think he knew like how long it would be for and like uh, he just needed to step out. So, so yeah, so the, the, the there was a, a, a time where where the guys were like uh well he's he's not coming back and we don't know like and and he was unsure i don't know if i come back and when so for a while it was a little bit of up in there and uh but then eventually he he decided that like uh no i did this is it i've i've had the time i i i needed so but I'm not, you know, I'm not sure that it's, if it, if it would be, you know, if the spot would have opened for me to, to join as an official member. I, I don't think so. I think it's more like if we would have had to wait for longer for Fredrik to come back. But for me, it uh, like in, in hindsight, especially it, it, it worked out for the best because I I became a, a dad in 2019. My, my son was born. Nice. Yeah, so thanks, man. So I went on tour with Meshuggah when he was six weeks old. Oh wow! And and it, yeah. it was only a three week tour, so it didn't feel too bad leaving. But when I got home, you know, and those weeks, you, you get home to a, to a a little baby that's twice the size as when you left, and and. Uh, and in a way, it, it was good, and and my wife handled everything in my absence. But but I, I was I was kind of devastated about it for a long time that I missed those three weeks that early on. Uh, so so before we <clears throat> we actually knew that Fredrik was coming back to the band, I I, I knew that I I was I was gonna. I was expecting to either be asked to do to keep touring, or to not keep touring. Yeah. So, and I was like, if they, and I knew that they had started working on, they were writing their new album. So, so I was like, if if they put out an album and we have to start touring again, and like if there's gonna be four week tours, maybe even longer, and and like do maybe three 
four long tours per year. And I was, yeah, so, and, and that just, I couldn't see that happening in, in this new world of mine where I had a, mm. a small, a small kid. I, I didn't want to be away for that long. So, uh, but then Freddie come, came back and the, the day before it went official, uh, our record label, Nuclear Bass, they, they knew about what was happening, uh, mm. behind the scenes, so, so, so to speak. So, they they contacted me and were like, uh, "Are you starting up Scar Symmetry again?" Because we are super interested. So so they were, you know, really eager to to re-sign with us because our uh, we had fulfilled the last deal we had. So mm. so they were super enthusiastic. I sent them the album. Uh, it wasn't a hundred percent done, but it it was in, in, in a pretty nice shape. Uh, mixing wise I, I sent it to them and they were like super super enthusiastic uh, which which also like gave me that like extra little kick in the butt to finish everything up and and get the boys together so that was kind of a crucial uh, little thing for me yeah a bit of a sliding doors moment isn't it I, I understand your perspective too by the way I was working away from home when my daughter my second daughter was born and uh, it's tough. You do. You come back after, in my case, it was four and five days stints coming back. But all of those four and five days stints after a couple of months start adding up and you realise you're away a bit too much. But yes, if if Thomas and management, because I've spoken to Thomas before and he strikes me as a fantastic fella. If, if mm-hmm. he had management and you you seem like you're of the sort of personality that actually fit in with, with Thomas, actually. So if they had mm-hmm. asked you to join, Fred hadn't come back. Is it something you would have seriously given? You would have seriously considered. Um, yeah, I mean that was. Uh, I guess that was the, the, the like the big reason why it was uh, a bit of a tricky situation for me because it, it's like a big gig. It's kind of an important gig in a way because mm. they are such an influential band. Yeah, I mean, I think they are an important band in in the world of music. Like, I think I, I think it's uh, it's for the best of everyone if if they they can continue for for a little bit longer, you know. And I I love the band, I love the music, I love the people, and I love the touring with them. I I had a blast. Uh, so if they would have asked me like, can you continue touring or or even you know, if it would been a deeper commitment than that as well it in a way it felt like it would be hard to say no mm. but i i couldn't imagine myself saying yes and tying myself you know down to that kind of touring schedule even though they not don't they don't tour as much as other bands i last last um uh October I, I was hanging out with my buddy Jeff Loomis from Arch Enemy. Nice. And and he's like he he's got a a son in a similar age. And and Arch Enemy was going out for I think three months. Oh. Something like crazy like that. So and and so we were talking about a bit about like being being a dad and being in a band and I you know I I I just could tell that he wasn't like and, and I mean, he's got a sick gig that, you know, it's like, like one of the best gigs, you know, for, <laughs> for a guy like him, right. it's perfect. You know, perfect. E- even though yeah. I've, I, even though I sometimes I miss Arch Enemy, uh, no, I miss Nevermore, sorry. Mm. Uh, yes, I'm, I, I miss, yeah, no, I, like I love yeah. Nevermore, but Ar- Arch Enemy is amazing for sure. Uh, yeah, so, so, so it's like his, uh, you know, his, he's sitting on the golden throne, you know, he's got that big gig and he gets to play mm big shows and he gets to shred his guitar and you know everything that he been wanting to do his entire life i i suppose and then like this is his this is his job this is what puts food on on the table for his family also so see he has to do it and he wants to do it but still there's there's that like heartbreaking feeling of you know leaving your family for a bit and uh and and i mean i i had the I had the gig with Meshuggah, which was a similar thing. You know, it was like a dream come true in, in many ways. And I got to play 
on big stages and and play this cool music and and they let me they let me do they, they let me be me within the context of their band i i got to play the solos like whatever way i wanted i improvised and had a lot of fun with it but it, it was yeah, yeah it was like the best times of my of my life for me uh but but still i mean i didn't de- get to decide to keep the job so i i was let go i guess uh but for me it, it was like the, the best possible outcome and and now i'm i'm the like the the boss of my own thing so now i can decide that we are not doing long tours like we, we're mostly doing like shorter like weekend long weekends and yeah. uh, festivals and stuff like we we're planning a tour in september that's looking to be like eight or ten dates mm. and uh most likely we, we won't go much longer than that and it's it's like a big difference being being away for less than two weeks than you know being away for five weeks or so mm. so i'm so i'm really really happy about about that that i, I that i get to Set, set things up, you know, the way that uh, it's going to be the best for mm. for my life and, and my bandmates, of course, as well. Yeah, I'm certainly not suggesting touring is a young man's game, but it's something resembling that, isn't it? And and even deeper than that, I'm a musician too, and uh, and you probably find this too. It's uh, a lot of my muso mates don't have families, but they have children, if that makes sense. So they're separated from their children's mother, and it might have happened in some cases decades ago. But their yeah. lives, I've got to be frank, their lives are a lot more chaotic than mine. Okay, because I'm married with kids. I'm, you know, I'm Christian, mm-hmm. so I've, I've, we've, we live a very family centric existence. And yeah. uh, we, that's a choice that I made very early on. But I don't, I've got to be frank, mate, I don't, I know very few people like me, even in my little scene here. So I can't imagine what it's like in your neck of the woods. Okay, there must be, and the pressure mm-hmm. that that type of touring would put on already fragile relationships. Yeah, indeed. I mean, I I got an amazing wife, and uh, before we we had our kid, uh, there was a long period where she was going to school, and she went to Stockholm for a bit to to school. She she was away uh, in in the weeks, uh, came home came home in the weekends. Uh, so we have had a not exactly an opposite scenario but we we've had like a long period of time where it's been it's been more about me like supporting her thing than vice versa so mm. so i i've sort of like i've sort of primed the relationship in a bit you know and uh but but she is great she is so uh yeah she she really she's really willing to you know hold it together when when i'm away and she's really happy for me that i get to do this and mm. and it's it's really nice yeah so and 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 so far it's i i, I have only i like i've been away five nights uh, in a row at the most from from my son and and so far it's it's been going great and yeah. it's also it's kind of it's kind of magical when I get home again, you know. And we <clears throat> we we talk every day on uh, like a video call, mm. yeah. You know, and 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 he he adores all of my bandmates <laughs> because like when they are visiting, they are always playing with him. So yeah, it's yeah, fun so time. It's, yeah, yeah. So yeah, but that's I, I, you. Sorry, you go. No, I, I just uh, I I appreciate uh, like how my life is right right now. I, I reckon the person that you choose to marry is about the most sing- is it the single most important decision you can make as a bloke. Okay, because mm-hmm. if you marry badly, your life is basically miserable, approaching living hell. And if you marry yeah. well you have an opportunity to explore all of these great gifts, these great talents, these God-given talents that you like you've got and you can clearly express yourself in that way and you don't have like all this emotional turmoil get, getting in the way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've yeah exactly. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, I've been, 
I was already 38 when, when I met my wife. So, so I, I had a, you know, sort of a long life behind me and I've been in some relationships in the past that has been, that has had their good sides, but also things that I, that I knew that I didn't want to, mm. you know, keep doing in, yeah. in my next relationship. So I, yeah. So then, you know, you know what you want. This turned into a relationship interview. That's nice. Uh -huh, a <laughs> I've, been, bit. I've been only talking about music all day. So <laughs> it's, it's actually kind of nice. <laughs> No, that's great. And, and I think this is a really important aspect of your psyche and indeed your career by extension for people to hear a little bit about because especially with uh, people who maybe take music at face value, they don't understand the depth of personalities behind what actually goes on and how really hard it can be. It can be, sure, it's it's mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's thrilling, it's rewarding, it's very exciting. The, uh, the serotonin rush you get from being on stage and ripping a huge solo like what you do in front of adoring fans, it must be unbelievable to get that but then you also get mm -hmm. the crash which can also turn into a burn and if you don't have a centered life and if you're not as say focused on and i firmly believe this you've got to put the family at the center of every decision that you make if you don't do that you're headed for it's just luck whether or not things work out or not yeah yeah absolutely because like right now i have such a nice setup like my wife and i we really I mean, we really support each other, and she's got a she's got a a pretty uh, what can I say? Well, she she's uh, she's working on her, her thesis. She's uh, right. she's a, the doctor, or doc, doctorate, doctorate, doctorate. Yes. Nice. Okay. So so she's um, she's having a lot of work, and 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 sometimes she has to go away on conferences and stuff. And uh, and sometimes she has to work a lot, and then there's more. I have to have more responsibility for 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 our son, and and which is nice. So we have this ebb and flow in between us, where like I'm going on tour, and she knows like she has to uh, she has to plan her work work day, her schedules, so that it it works, you know, for her. Mm -hmm. It's it's very good for her to not plan something super important when I'm away. Uh, even even if Henry is at, at preschool, I mean mm. he's a small child, so you know they get they get the colds and flus and uh, oh god yeah I all remember. these things yeah, yeah. like it, it sometimes it's like every every second or third week he's oh, home from yeah. preschool. So so if you're if you're at home like. Uh, and the other one, the other, the, your partner is away. You have you don't want to have anything super important planned in case you <laughs> you have to deal with that. So I remember, but it's, I, yeah, you're just like sick for the for the first three years of their life almost. But we don't get really winter here, as you're probably aware. So thank God for that. But yeah. in your neck of the woods, mate, I can only bloody imagine. You know that that change from being inside of uh, central heating in every building you walk into, but how cold it is in, outside as well, and the juxtaposition Indeed. of the two. Yeah. Indeed, but yeah, if if we for some reason you know suddenly would decide to 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 divorce right now, you know, and I'm like, oh, I gotta have my kid every other week, and we've gotta sell the house, and I can't keep my workroom, and I like where 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 am I supposed to have all my gear? It it would be a mess, you know. So uh, so here, I'm hoping it won't happen, and <laughs> and yeah, yeah, I'm I'm, think, I'm thinking I'm I'm putting in the time and effort and. And everything to, yeah, to keep everyone in the house happy. Yeah, yeah. So, so right now, obviously, scar symmetry is the center of attention. But you've also got a fairly extraordinary list of accomplishments insofar as your production, mixing, and engineering career. So, is that something that you've got a bit of a backlog of, and you'll start kicking back into that once the cycle of promotion and potentially even those small tours that you've mentioned for scar symmetry are over? Uh, no. Actually, a few years ago, I decided to to not do too much of that that kind of work uh, because I'm I'm feeling like, uh, and I think this uh, this has all to do with getting older and feeling mm -hmm. like it's sometimes it's hard to find time for everything. Like before, I had kids, I could sometimes work you know around the clock, and and that's not really 
possible anymore. So and and yeah. the older I get, the more important is it's it gets to to do the stuff that I want to do. You know, like this, it's like a, a slow realization that the, all of our days are numbered. You know, so so I wanna I wanna spend time on on my music and on the stuff that's important to me, and not so much, you know, produce an album for for another band. That's, I mean, I I really enjoy that kind of work, but I I enjoy doing my own thing way more. So. Yeah. So I'm, I'm. I I actually stopped doing that kind of thing. Maybe later. Maybe later on when you've settled. You know, all all of the musical goals, personal musical goals, or many of them have been ticked off and the like. Because I can't imagine that. Uh, I, I should say, I imagine you get a lot of calls and a lot of emails. Hey, are you available? We'd like you to do this. Yeah. Sure. Sure. I get get offers for work, but yeah. Not but now. it's it's like, it, and and it's actually uh, since I've been I've been like sort of juggling being a guitar player and like a, and having my band and playing in other bands, recording with other bands, uh, touring with other bands, and I've I've juggled that with being a mix engineer and a producer, and and sometimes I also feel feel like uh, when I do everything when i do all of these things uh i mean i've been playing guitar since i was a kid so i I think i have got i i think i got that down but the whole thing about mixing it's i think i'm pretty good at it but it's super time consuming because i i it's not my it's never been my full-time thing so when i work on an album sometimes it feels like i have to reinvent the wheel again for for myself Uh, yeah it's like, uh, you know, like, oh, I, I can't get the, the drum kit to sound good. Like, what was that thing I did last time? I can't remember. Like, so how true. do you do this? And yeah. I, yeah. And and uh, I think that if if I would have done that, uh, turned that into my career and done that full time, I think I could probably have been doing really good for myself. But uh but it was always only a part-time thing, and then yeah, so so it's it's also a struggle to to do that for me because I wouldn't say perhaps that I'm not good enough, but I'm not uh, I'm not experienced enough to to just keep pushing out, you know, dependable uh, results. That's inter- that's a very interesting take you've got on your own career there because you've got a, a career as long as my arm insofar mm. as work that you've done so yeah you, you're either being very hard on yourself or you've got very high aspirations yeah yeah i think i got pretty high aspirations and 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 also it's got to be, i have to say that it's it's difficult to it's difficult to have a an audio career today because it's as everyone know the budgets are going down and and sometimes i you know i i I get sent projects to mix and it's recorded by uh like it's home recordings by great musicians who are not audio engineers so they they send me stuff that's not recorded as well as it should be and sometimes the performances are because they are not producers either they might be good performers but they are not producers so maybe they don't have like the ear for what the best take would be so sometimes i i end, end up trying to fix recordings and you know yeah and you try to solve things in the mix that that would be easily you know solved in, if you just would have a, had had the chance to re-record a part yeah so so you put it all that work and all of the extra work that that can take uh and and then you yeah you the pay is not always very good. So, plus you've got to deal with 
bands. <laughs> and yeah, look, yeah. I, I've been in a studio in bands that I've been a part of, and the singer's been an absolute pain in the ass to the producer. Just unnecessarily yeah. difficult too, asking demanding things, having small mini tantrums, this sort of thing. You know, adults doing this to me has always been completely ridiculous. Mm-hmm. You know, you employ a professional because that's what they do and whatever they choose to do ultimately you, unless it's yeah, there's a problem and the, the, those don't really happen in my experience. I'm sure that they had come up, but uh, you let them get on yeah. with the business of getting on with their job. But I bet you've had to deal with some real doozies in your time as well. <laughs> uh, well, in, in my production career, it hasn't been too bad actually but mm. i mean sometimes you get the the mix revisions like uh, you get paper after paper or or oh, like God. a computer computer uh, text document where it's like the drummer wants me uh, like can you like uh, more snare more kick more toms and uh, more overheads okay so basically all the drums and then the guitar player is like can you raise the guitar by two dbs and then the singer is like, can you give me more re- reverb and uh, much higher? And then it's like, oh. Why do you don't want to a... do it? Yeah, this is a point, though. It's I mean, you can, okay, being in a sugar, that's one thing. Having your own band, that's something else. Again, you get the lot lost rests on your shoulders as well. But there's so much outside of your control when you're in the producers or the mixing chair because you're. it's interesting, I find. My observation is you're not necessarily dealing with a musical outcome. You're dealing with people's feelings. In that chair, yes, yeah, and it's exactly. it just seems yeah it just seems like uh, if you don't have the temp, I, I personally I know I wouldn't have the temperament for it. I'm not saying I'd lose my temper, but at some point I go, mm-hmm. guys, if you think you can do a better job, have at it. Okay, that's yeah. that would be my attitude. Yeah, exactly. No, yeah. so I'm I'm really I'm I'm just happy to be to be back where I belong and and doing my own thing and. And I'm not, you know, some people, they write short term goals and long term goals and they are really good at, you know, doing that. (laughs) I I don't really do that. But like my, my mid, like uh, the next few years, maybe next five years, it's, Mm. it might be as far as I can see uh, career wise, but the, the plan is to keep going with score symmetry be much quicker than nine years in between releases mm. you know and try try to go play everywhere where it's possible yeah, start doing I'm, maybe I'm start, <laughs> start doing some yeah and i, I want to start doing some some music on my own some some solo stuff that's i mean now that i write all the music for score symmetry there's it feels a little bit like a solo project in that I get to write all of the notes. Uh, but there's also like a lot of music in me that's not, that wouldn't fit yeah. in Scar Symmetry. So, so I want to do some of that. And then there's just no time for, for producing for other people. No, of course not. Yeah. Are you thinking of going in a more, far more melodic direction, a bit like what uh, Kuiper's about or even beyond that? Yeah, could could be like that. I mean, I I've always liked all kinds of different styles of music, which which I think that people probably can tell from from the songwriting in Scar Symmetry that it's like it's it is sort of melodic death metal, but there's like pop choruses and there's power metal thing and there's fusion style solos, so you you can hear all these things seeping into our music, and uh, it would be nice to to sometimes be able to take one of those things and and get away with some of the death metal things. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Because you managed to cram quite a lot into your music and you've got a beautiful voice too, it's got to be said. And that voice, yeah, I'd love to, I'd love to hear what you can do with that without so much distorted guitars. Oh, thanks, man. Yeah, yeah. That, that's also something I, I would, would love to explore. Were you a singer? I mean, you 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 can sing. I, I can hear that. I'm a singer too. I, I sing a lot of. I sing in cover bands. You see, and I'll, I'll take on uh, mm-hmm. a lot of uh, new wave and rock songs. Seems to be my thing. My voice is a uh, bit of a, yeah. a high end baritone, if you like. But um, 
you, were you a singer originally who switched across to guitar? Like, you know, I understand in Sweden's got a very got no, a wonderful no, music. No, pro- yeah. No, no, not not at all. Is uh, I was always like embarrassed to sing, and if I would. Uh, sang something at a party or something when i was younger i i always like sang in a falsetto like you know made a little bit of fun of myself bit, bit and, of a king diamond know. sort of a thing yeah uh yeah uh but then i don't know maybe like 15 20 years ago i started singing a little bit and uh in in a different uh, uh context and then i started recording uh uh, harmony vocals for scar symmetry because it was easier for me to just record myself than like instructing the vocalist how to do it and mm. and and i found that it was also nice often to have a different timbre in in the background and and at, at like along the way i started appreciating some of the sounds that came out of my voice i didn't i didn't hate everything anymore but but <laughs> like the, where i'm am where i am right now is that i mean i i sing backing vocals f- live and i i've got a few like sort of almost lead parts as well that i do live uh, and and i don't sing nearly as good live as i do in the studio so i'm i'm like a studio singer where i can where i where i can do like multiple takes and you know if there's a if there's a note or two that's a little bit off pitch you know you can go in and and mm. nudge them and uh, you know and and live you are stuck with what you got so so but um it's it's a work in progress yeah yeah please do continue with it because you do to your point have a lovely timbre and it's something that matches your your heavy stuff really well and if you decide oh, to go thanks. more of a more of a uh you know, not like in that Marco uh, from Nightwish vein. I think that might be a bit too operatic. But uh, mm-hmm. if you went, I'm trying to think. Uh, there's somebody came to mind when I was listening to your voice. But uh, anyway, it, it sort of flew away. Whoever I was trying to compare you to, but it was a favourable comparison at the very least. Anyway, by the way, and uh, oh, that's and it nice. Was more more of a more of a rock sort of a thing, like mm-hmm. uh, Opeth. That's right, Opeth. It was sort of in that direction. All right. Yeah, oh. doing something like that. Yeah, I reckon you could easily, not easily, but you know. Probably, probably for mm-hmm. you easily, but you know, for everybody yeah, else, it I be mean, so easy. <laughs> and I mean, you have to write stuff that's in your register and that like suits your yeah. expression. What? Hey, key? man, we've run, we've we've run out of time. I see. Oh bummer. Um, that's sorry about that, mate. I do tend to want to have these long form conversations, but uh, thank you so much for giving me so much of your time. Yeah. Appreciate it. God yep. bless with everything, mate, and I uh, hope to see you down here. Thanks, man. This, this was an absolute pleasure. Hope awesome. to talk longer next time. Absolutely. On the next album, we'll do it. I'm going to keep on doing this, so no doubt I'll catch you on the other side. <laughs> awesome. You have a great uh, night, I suppose. Thank you, brother. I'm off to have a shower yeah. and then to bed, but uh, you enjoy the rest of the day, man. Thanks, man. Cheers. No catch ya. Bye. See ya. Yes, I want to do that, aren't I? I do tend to take a little bit more time than maybe what's allocated, but I do it all in good faith because I just love what it is that I do here and I want to share these conversations with you. And a great big thank you to Pear for such a, a deep and meaningful chat. That one right there. I haven't had one like that in quite some time, but uh, I enjoyed that one a lot. Now, if you like that chat, You can go across to scarsandguitars.com where all of my other episodes are posted. Of course, they're on YouTube and Spotify too, but please do check out my website because I want you to have a look at my book, Scars and Guitars, Volume 1, Conversations from the World of Heavy Metal and Beyond. Click on the link in the banner there and you'll be taken to a marketplace of your choice where you can try before you buy, that sort of thing. Something else, I'm going on the 70,000 Tons of Metal cruise in January and February, at least I'm scheduled to do so. And uh, I've got a bit of a promo banner going on there for the 70,000 tons of metal thing. It leaves late January from the port of Miami. Sailing through the Caribbean, is it? I think it is. Anyway, south of Florida. And uh, I'm looking forward to it. Looking forward to being a journalist on the boat there and meeting even more bands and fans and drinking and carrying on. And yeah, it's something that... uh, I've been looking at doing for some time, but the opportunity, what is, what's the saying about opportunity met um, timing or something? Anyway, 
that is what's happened. So before I let you go, I'm going to wish you a fond farewell. I've got some more information to share with you about my book, Scars and Guitars, Volume 1, in the moment. My name is Andrew Mackay-Smith, and I'm the host of this show, Scars and Guitars. Until next time, it's a very good bye, but now... This is Eric Rutan of Cannibal Corpse. You are listening to the Scars and Guitars podcast with Andrew McKay-Smith. I've been the host of the Scars and Guitars podcast since 2017. The first musician I interviewed for the show was David Vincent from Morbid Angel, and things have just snowballed from there. In all, I've posted almost 650 podcast episodes featuring conversations with many of the leading lights of rock, heavy metal, and beyond. It just got to a point where I thought, I need to write a book about all this, so that's exactly what I did. In Scars and Guitars Volume 1, you'll read a heap of deep reveals and commentary, such as Des Fafara talking about Cold Chamber and why the band will never return. You know, if you're a a band just starting out, you need to hear me. Do not start a band with partners. Yeah, wise words there. Sage advice, mate, for anybody. Don't ever, because I I can't go do Cold Chamber right now unless I get others involved. Phil Anselmo talks about the episode in his career, which gives him the greatest sense of accomplishment. I think the staying power of the the fans and the staying power of the the songs, you know, whether it's Pantera, Down, or Superjoint, the fans remember the songs. Alex Skolnick from Testament confirms that, yes, Playing the guitar in Ozzy's band is anything but an ordinary gig. Will Silent Oz from Demu Borgir write a book? Pa from Sabaton gives advice to people who want to start a band. Look at the team around you, look at the bandmates. If uh, if the guys want to be on the stage, then it's all cool. If the guys want to be backstage, then it's not going to be cool. Current and former members of Cradle of Filth discuss the band's seminal 90s material. Read about the reaction to George Lynch and Mark from Suicide Silence's comments when they throw shade at then-President Donald Trump. We have this idiotic monster, you know, this egotistical, self-aggrandizing, complete piece of shit in there. I, I, I I just can't understand how we've gotten to this place. And yeah, we kicked a hornet's nest with Sepultura. Percussive overlord Gene Hoagland talks about recording with Chuck Schuldiner. Chuck was always, um, you know, he was, he was very, you know, very open-minded, and and he was into having his his musicians that were playing with him just reach out for for the best stuff that they had. Phil Campbell from Motorhead discusses what it takes to get sober. John Five answers his critics who dismiss his tenure with Marilyn Manson. You know, my name is John Five, and Manson gave me that name, and um, I had some of the best years of my life in that band and, and learned a lot. And we get the lowdown on Trey Zagtoth from those who would know, including his mother. All across Scars and Guitars Volume 1, there are moments of tension, relief, tragedy, exhilaration, and throughout it all, you'll obtain insight that I believe no one else has managed to obtain from many of your favourite artists. So treat yourself. Scars and Guitars Volume 1 is currently available as an ebook with a print edition on the horizon. Follow the links attached and download a sample. I'm sure you'll be compelled to read the whole book.